Welcome to the Driving Change Podcast on the Evergreen Podcast Network, where we live at the intersection of neuroscience and storytelling. If you love great stories and you love understanding the mindset it takes to be a world-class change agent, then join us as our fascinating guests from all walks of life unpack their unique journeys of perseverance and passion, of expertise and experience, and be inspired to use your own story to drive change. Welcome back to the Driving Change Podcast today. I know every time I say this is a unique show, it's because it is. I always have amazingly unique uh, guests on. But today is the 100th episode of the Driving Change Podcast. And we we thought we'd take a, a risk here, not because of the guests that we have on, but because we're doing more than one guest at a time to celebrate the 100th episode of the Driving Change Podcast. And, and today, um, I think you're going to be thrilled. These guests have been on the show as individuals, but you know, their, their fame precedes them. And, and what I love about each one of these gentlemen is their passion and heart for service of others and using their God-given gifts and abilities to make other people better. And my first guest is hailed by the New York Times as someone who has quietly become one of the most influential people in America. And if you know him, you say maybe not so quietly, but that's here nor there. We'll talk about that at a different time. Andy Andrews is Golly, he's written so many amazing books from the, the Traveler's Gift to The Noticer. He's got an amazing podcast. We're going on and on and on. If you want to learn a lot more about the stuff he does, go back and listen to the original episode. But we'll get into some of that today. Uh, Andy's just an amazing keynote speaker, and he's an amazing mentor and teacher to so many others. He's on the show today. Andy, welcome. I'm just going to keep rolling. The next guest, also Sports Illustrated named Bob Bodine, the top Front, what they call him, the top front office matchmaker in sports, as well as, here's a theme, most influential man in sports that you've never heard of. And Bob's been on, he's placed people like Deion Sanders out in Colorado. And that, you know, we'll talk about that maybe a little bit later as well. And Bob has just got such a, he's just such a wealth of experience, knowledge, and information in what he's done. And then our last guest has also been billed as one of the most influential songwriters from Nashville to LA. I'm not sure who he paid to say that about him, but uh, Jimmy Yeary has written 14 number one hit songs and Grammy awards and yada, yada, yada. has become a dear friend as well. And he's an amazing storyteller in the craft of songwriting and has such a passion to teach people how to communicate through that lens with a little bit more purpose and intentionality. So these, these gentlemen are just, he, in a lot of ways, I know we use these words sometimes hyperbolic, but they are heroes of mine. They're people that I look up to, I admire, because not just because of what they've accomplished, but because of what they're doing for the world at large. So gentlemen, welcome to the 100th episode of the Driving Change Podcast. And congratulations to you on 100 of them. That's huge. Yes, yes. Yeah, so proud of you. That's fantastic. Milestone. Thank you, thank you. So um, never thought we'd get there, honestly, when we started doing this. And so uh, as you guys know, when we, I think I told you before, when we started this, it was just me teaching. And then it turned out people like to listen to other people more than me. So I said, we should probably invite those other people on and let's make a show out of it. That'll be more fun. Uh, who knew? It, people loved it. So I, I, I'm going to start with a, with, a, with a big, with a kind of a, a, a big question as you look at reflectively, as you think about all the conversations you're having with people today, day in, day out, what's that? one piece of advice that you received that you find yourself passing on to others the most frequently. So maybe a piece of advice that you received somewhere along the line that you just didn't even realize this is pretty consistent. You keep passing the same piece of advice on to others with pretty consistent frequency. Any, anybody want to start on that one? I'll let you guys jump in. Yeah, and I'll, I'll start. I got uh, a piece of advice 30, 40 years ago and it went over my head it was a very simple, but it was so odd, I kept remembering it. It was from the old guy who found me when I was living on the beach. And and uh, what he said was, uh, you can't believe everything you think. And that mm. sounded very odd to me. I didn't really understand it. But after years of unpacking it, uh, now, I, I use it every day. I use it with my clients. I use it with my family. I use it I, I, every decision I make filters through this. And here's the best way I can explain what that means. <clears throat> Don't believe everything you think. Have you, have you ever known something? I mean, you knew it and you could argue it and you could win the argument every time. And then you found out six months later, oh, well, that wasn't exactly right. 
or my information was a little incomplete. Okay, well, if you've ever done that, does the possibility exist that something you know now, your information might be incomplete? And you would say, well, Andy, of course, something I know now, my information might be incomplete. And I would agree. But the point is, we don't know what that is, do we? And we don't know how many subjects that may cover in, in, in our lives. You know, when we all want to achieve to our potential, and and yet in achieving to our pen, potential, when we're not there as human beings, we tend to think it's because we're missing something. There's something that I'm, I don't know. But it's not that. The danger in reaching your potential is not because you're missing something. Because when when you don't know something, you keep asking, you keep Googling, you keep listening, you keep discussing. The biggest danger to reaching our potential is what we know for sure. Because that's when we stop mm. looking, stop listening. That's so yeah, good. That. That's so good. Bob, what about you? You know, uh I so I I, I always talk I always talk about my dad and uh and, and some great things. I I was just blessed to have a great mom and dad and and so they always passed on and, and things that I try to do with my three daughters and my grandkids as well. And so one of the ones that I always have is you can never be successful at what you like. You have to love it. You have to just go in crazy. And, you know, there's 180 words or so in the Greek language for, for love. And we got one. So I love my wife, Cheryl, of 40 years. I love tacos. So it's really confusing. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> you got to love what you do. You cannot sustain liking. All 180 words are all better than like. So I could tell each of your wives, hey, and we could get to be friends. And I tell them I love them. And you're not like thinking, oh, I'm worried Bob just said he loves him. The world is trying to stop the L word. You know, they're trying to get you not to say love. And, uh, you know, and so, you know, I go around the country trying to tell people to text their friends. Hey, I'm, I'm I was just thinking about you. I wanted to tell you how much I appreciate your friendship. I love you. And, uh, you know, when people send that back to their mate today, 94 percent said, did you mean that for me? And uh, <laughs> and the reason is, is that that the people you love don't understand that word friendship and the people who are your friends don't understand the word love, but you want to escalate. God only uses a language of love. And so when you get into the right language, you move into success significantly. And when you love something, you're obsessed with it. I'm sure like Jimmy and Andy, who I love, I love, Jimmy doesn't even know how much I love all his songs. And <laughs> I never have a chance to even know him. Andy, I'm like stalk him for his stories. And so I, that's what I would probably say today. That's great. And just to the audience, you know, by the way, if you're listening to this right now and you haven't already taken out your pen and paper and started writing down notes, you might want to do that because I think this is going to be one of those shows. Uh, but the, the audience the audience doesn't know this story. And I, Andy, I don't even know if, if, if we've ever talked about it. So, so, so I met Andy. I don't even remember how I met Andy now, but I met Andy and then Andy immediately we connected. He's like, you got to meet my friend Jimmy. So I'm, I'm saying I'll say Bob wrote the book, the book, The Power of Who. If you've not read The Power of Who, you got to go get The Power of Who. So I meet Andy and he and I hit it off and we start to share values with each other and stories and through shared stories and shared values, you start to see your shared purpose. He immediately says, you got, you got to meet my friend Jimmy. And so I meet Jimmy through Andy and Jimmy and I are thick as thieves. We've become yes. brothers already from another yes. mother, right? Quickly because of that idea of, of what you're getting at, Bob. And then I meet Bob and I meet Bob and we go down and we get together and we have breakfast and we're hanging out. We start to become friends and Bob makes me he, he puts me through this exercise of texting someone randomly a positive affirmation with I love you. And I would picked Andy and I give it, I sent that text to Andy. I'm like, he's going to feel so weird that I just texted him that I love him. And it was great because that made the connection between Bob and Andy and then Bob and Andy got connected. So this stuff you're talking about, Bob, it's real. This emotional contagion, especially around right. love uh, is real. And honestly, I think without it, the three of us or four of us wouldn't all be together on this right. show yeah, at one right. time. So that's a, that's a great, great, Point. So, and by the way, before you go, Jimmy, Andy, how weird was it when you got a text from me telling telling you that I loved you? Well, I I actually didn't think it was that weird. You know, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I I appreciated it. I knew where it was coming from. I didn't know it was coming from Bob, but I knew where in your heart that was coming from. And you know, I mean, Jimmy and I, we we end every conversation, every text thing with I love you and and so 
It, it's a, That's good. Men don't do that, right? To Bob's point, men don't typically do that because it has this weird connotation. And I think if we started to lean into it a little bit more, it, it would be fine. So, Jimmy, all right, what about you? You got to drop some wisdom. Oh, gosh, uh, after all that. I'm just wondering why I, I haven't received a text that you love me. I, I'm a little bit like, what? I just, that's never happened from you. So, anyway, we'll talk about that later. But, um, wow. <laughs> trying to make you feel bad. Uh, you know what? I, as I sit here and I think about that wonderful question, I'm, uh, a big thing has always been for me, you know, I, uh, I try real hard the advice of not caring about people's opinions of me. So even actively today, I'll try to, as I'm mentoring other people, I'll try to help them. I think you can be the most successful and achieve your greatest goals if you don't go around so concerned about people's opinions of you. Because then you can objectively make decisions and you can take chances and take risks um, I often, if I, get, if I get nervous around somebody that I perceive to be important, a lot of times I might imagine they don't like me. They don't like what I do and they don't like the direction in which I'm headed and I become okay with that. And then I can continue to make decisions based on, on, on what I feel is the best thing to do and not compromise those decisions. So I think about that. I think about a scripture in the Bible that says, be anxious for nothing. That's a good piece of advice that I adhere to. I tried to not worry about things so much. And uh, so, and also, Andy, opening my eyes to the why. Why does this happen? Why are your songs working? Why does this work? Why are you feeling happy? Why are you feeling not so happy? Analyze that and get to the bottom of the pool, which uh, I'll throw out his book, one of my favorite books ever. And just really, it's just, a, I, it changed my life. And I pass that on to people as well that I mentor to try to help them Understand to the core, why is what you're doing working or not working? And when you get to the bottom, you can figure that out. So, yeah, those things I live by every day. That's good. My, uh, I think it was my grandma that said, what, what somebody else thinks of you is none of your business. <laughs> right. That is right. <laughs> right. You put that That's in the song. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Love it. Oh, that, that's, that's three really good. Again, here we go. We're, uh, we are talking about we have we have three of the most influential men in business, sports, speaking, music, all on the same show. If you're just catching on, we're the wisdom of ages from three undeniable sages on stages. That's pretty cool, right there. Right? We should call that this, right? Sages yeah, on good. stages. Um, so I, I have an interesting one. I'm curious now because you guys are also well accomplished, and and one of the things that I'm attracted to are men with high motors. People in general, not just men, but but people with high motors. What I mean by that is, it's the work ethic that I learned on the farm growing up. Right, is that people that go get after it uh, in, in the right way, but they have a high work ethic and as a as a way that they just want to accomplish. You know, I believe we were created by the Creator to be creative, and I think I'm attracted to people who like to create and do, and, and they're active. And I think of you three men as people who do that. Sometimes the collateral damage of that though can be our, our personal lives sometimes take a little shrapnel from our professional lives. And I'm wondering, and I've had to try to figure out ways of balancing that over the years. I'm wondering how each of you have been able to successfully do that, or maybe times when you haven't and what that, what that's looked like. How do you, how do you make the main thing, the main thing as fathers and hu you know, husbands and, and, and not lose sight of that, knowing that we're, we're almost like type A driven to accomplish people out in the professional world. Okay, well, so I don't, I don't, I don't want to answer that? this first. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to answer this first. But I do want to. I do want to make the point that what Bob said a minute ago that um, you know you, you will not succeed at something you like. You got to love it. Well, people with high motors love it. You don't see people with high motors that just like something. Yeah, that's yeah. you're 100 percent right. I. I I found that, uh, you know, in this time is that, you know, where you put your start, your first, your values. And of course I put God and I put my family and, and then I put the person right in front of me and, uh, you know, can you be present in what you're doing? And that kind of reestablishes things. I mean, I grew up with a dad that said, if you can't get your job done in eight hours, you stink. And, uh, <laughs> and what's so f interesting about that is we have, the creator of the world inside us. He's given us the, the mind of Christ. He's given us a new heart. And we, we are skilled and capable of doing so much more 
within us and do it. And so when the energy that you're bringing each day is, is as Andy's talking about, and as you listen to, to Jimmy's songs, the energy that the song brings because it touches your heart so much changes everyone around you. You carry this like personal environment. So with my family of having three girls, I just, you know, I just kept always starting with God. Of course, I wrote two chairs. You got to start with God every morning. First thing you get a minute to talk, he gets four minutes. And so you listen and then, uh, and then, and then you start to figure out what you have to do today. And of course I traveled 7 million miles, but I didn't miss any of my daughter's recitals or softball games and all that kind of stuff. Cause it was, it was just, you know, Hey, something had to give and I'm not, I'm not giving on that. That's wow. good. Good. We think well, Jimmy. I mean, what a, uh, Bob, that was amazing. I love that. Give, give God, uh, I'll, I'll take one minute, give him four so just to <laughs> listen. I'm going to, I love that. Um, you know, listen, I, motors revved up, ready to go. Andy's correct. When, when you love what you're doing, it definitely fuels you, but that doesn't keep my wife from aggravating me sometimes. So, <laughs> so what I have to do, I, I truly imagine that I'm, I've got this bag full of a hundred pennies in it every day. And it's my hundred pennies of creativity. And, and if I get in a spat with her or get frustrated over things that don't matter, I'm going to lose some of those creative pennies. If I, if my kids are driving me crazy and, 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 and I'm, and I'm getting all frustrated and I'm getting caught up in, 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 in the frustration of it because I have things to do and I have important places to be and I'm so important and I'm losing pennies. And by the time I get downtown, I'm frustrated because the traffic won't move for me. And, 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 and I, somebody said they're going to cut my song and they didn't record it. And then I didn't get a single on Tim McGraw and he said it was going to be. And I've get to town and now I've got to create a song and I've got two pennies out of a hundred left. And so I'm emotionally not able to tap into the, the required emotion so I can feel something so other people can feel it. And that goes for songs. That goes for having a meeting with Andy. That, that goes for whatever. If I want to be my best, I have to protect my hundred pennies. Yeah. Love that. How, how does that Jimmy as a follow-up for Andy goes like, how, how does that, how, how do you balance how many of those pennies might actually be for your family? You used to mess create creativity, but you know there's you know, you're spending a assets, right? You're spending energy and time. Time is our greatest asset, whether it's a creative penny or not. How do you balance which bag has the the money that gets spent on the family? Yeah, I just think of it from a stress standpoint. I, uh, you know, I can I, I I can appropriately manage anything as long as I'm not getting frustrated. I always uh, think if I'm stressing much, I'm messing up. I'm doing it wrong. If I'm getting aggravated, there's a way to, to do things for me. I think about, you know, just to, just to, rem just to really, uh, uh, appreciate the moment, uh, uh, and, and the value of the moment and the value of the challenge, but just don't lose the creative juices. But yeah, I definitely have the priorities, the kids, God, family, um, uh, you know, and just to, to, to manage those without, cause you know, uh, it's, we all know it's easy to get frustrated and frustration and aggravation tend to zap your creative juices more than, than anything else. Hmm. That's good. Andy, how about you? My time in being balanced is, is starts with the two chairs concept. You know, it starts early morning with me and God and one minute of me and four minutes of God. Cause I, I, um, I asked an old man one time, <clears throat> I said, how do you pray? You know, I mean, this guy was wealthy. He was successful in life. He, you know, he's almost 90 years old. And I said, how do you pray? And he said, well, Sometimes I just get real quiet and I ask God, what's on your heart? And I'm just quiet and I just listen. And and I I have found that that not only is that a great question, the quality of our questions or the quality of our answers is is often determined by the quality of our questions, you know. Um 
You ask good questions, you get good answers. But you ask bad questions, you get bad answers. Ask, don't ask any questions, you won't get any answers, I guess. But, but, but asking good questions leads to leads to a wiser person thinking through something. And and I've tried to be that with with my boys, you know, with. Uh, with my family, I, I I know there's the question: What's more important, quality time or quantity? And I I strongly believe the answer is both. You know, you got to you just got to have both. I mean, there are times with your family that it's just important that you're present, that you're just there, and and that that you're paying attention. You know, I, I've, I've said, you know, my my first son was born when I was 40, so I, I'm kind of an older dad. And and I, I, I've i said that the good thing about being an older dad is you're not as stressed by certain things, uh, but the bad thing is everything they want to do is on the floor. You know, <laughs> come down here, Dad. No, let Dad sit on the couch. No, Dad, come down here. And so... You know they they want you present, and that's part of why. With my family, I knowing that I got to choose my times. I I have uh, not raised them snow skiing, and I have raised them hunting. And the reason you know snow skiing, it takes a lot of time, and they're over there. And I'm over here. Even if we're skiing together, they're over there, and I'm over here. There's not a lot of conversation going on. But I tell people, I tell dads and moms all the time, if you, you want to really get to know your child, take them deer hunting. I mean, you, you ain't got to have a gun. Take a camera. But, but that time with your child in a box, in a blind that's four feet by six feet, and there's no television, there's no Game Boy, there's, you know, and, and you're sitting there waiting for something, watching, and and you're whispering to each other for two or three hours at a time. I mean, it's, it's where I had my most influential moments with my boys. Yeah, that's good. That's good. It reminded me of a, I think John Maxwell said, maybe, 15 years ago, I heard him say that, you know, they say with age comes wisdom, but sometimes age comes alone. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, what you guys are getting at, though, is it, it should come with wisdom. And we should be able to, to know those things as we get older and pass them down the line. Um, now, you guys all three get a chance to speak a lot and speak to a lot of people at a time, right? We're on st- st- stages all over, all over the world. When you think about that as a calling, as a responsibility, how would you articulate your keynote speaking and your style and approach as part of your purpose? Like, how do you think and prepare for those? It's a little bit of an odd question because I want to give someone an insight that doesn't do speaking for a living that might look at people who do and say, well, they're just they're just geared differently. And if I bet you if I ask all three of you, and I have at some point, people tell me, man, don't you just get super nervous? I'm like, I, I, I don't. Like I get so much use stress out of going out on a stage because it's such a passion for me and a purpose that I have. Um, and I just was curious if you could give the, your your perspective on how you feel relative to your calling on, as a teacher on a stage, which you all three get to do a lot of. Mm. Well, Tim, I'll go. just start out by saying that, you know, you, I, I do get nervous uh, oftentimes because I still struggle with the, you know, uh, uh, t- I, I can I can tend to, to to fall prey to feeling like an imposter, and because I haven't been speaking for a very long time, I love it so much. I love it more than anything I've ever done. So passionate about it, but but uh, so I can tend to get nervous, which only uh, uh, drives me uh, 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 f- uh, deeper into preparation. But I <clears throat> I l- listen when I get up there, I want to. What, what, what impassions me is that I want people to understand that their goofy lives are valuable. I want people to understand that where they came from, 
the the the, the house, the road, the, the 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 field, the mom and dad, the no mom and dad, the whatever. I just want them to know the triumphs and tragedies of their life are extraordinarily valuable and that they can utilize those stories like I do, my goofy story, to write songs and cause millions of people oftentimes to gravitate towards them. So so that's what drives me and that's what uh, uh, excites me um, is to get there and to be able to do that. That's, that's great. And I know that about you. And in fact, you and I have gotten a chance to speak together. And we're going to get a chance more this year to do that. And that's what I think people are drawn to you is your authenticity around their story. Not your story, but their story, which is which is really cool. Bob, Bob or Andy, you want to jump in on this one? You know, I'll tell you, I I agree. I've I've heard you know I've heard Andy talk. I've heard you know you talk before Jeff and and hear and various things. And now I've listened, of course, to all the great songs that that Jimmy's wrote. And and I listen. I, the reason I'm never nervous is I'm never talking about me. It's never about me. <laughs> And I think that's what Jimmy really has got to the heart of. And I, that's why he's a great heart singer, because people today, you know, are are feeling lousy. Seventy nine percent of the people haven't gotten over the pandemic. And so they don't really have any energy left. They only got 16 percent left. And so they're wondering what the heck they're going to do. And they need someone to first come in and brighten it up. And we are, and, and the, and, and all of us are just like, we love speaking. So we're going to have fun speaking. So I'm telling Arnold Palmer stories. I'm telling, I'm getting them to hug each other in the first three minutes. I got people text messaging their friends, telling them they love it. They're getting all these signs back. <laughs> and, and I just, it's just a nonstop. So, you know, as I, t you know, when you were like even talking about before is look at time isn't our enemy it's a paradigm. Timing's our best friend. And so uh, that's why I'm never like worried or anxious or any of that, because I just like when you write a book, I'm expecting God to just tell me. And so in the morning, I lay it all down. And then there's a great exchange that occurs. If I didn't get that from the morning, I'm sunk. And so he then gives me peace and joy and insight and wisdom and power and favor. And I believe it. That's the that's the hard part. The reason I'm never nervous is Mike, I get the easy job to speak. I believe what I'm saying. And God has the hard part. He's got to get everybody else to do all the stuff. And I leave the rest uh, to what it is. That's great. Wow. Andy, how about you? Yeah, I, you know, I have, I, I know it's a, an unusual speaking style. Um, I, my speaking style has been called, uh, he doesn't look like he knows what he's doing. <laughs> and, and, and I understand that. I, I'm working with a, a young pastor uh, right now with his speaking. And, and I, I, after watching him several times, I asked him, I said, do you, you know, do you want to be a preacher or do you want to be a communicator? And, and he said, well, I want to be a communicator. I said, well, then you got to lay off the preaching a little bit. I, I mean, a, as a style, right? Um, because whether it's in church or in a corporate environment, people want to be brought along. They want to have a conversation. They, they don't want to be told what to think. They want to be... They want to be cajoled into thinking in a different way and then having that that joy of proving something to themselves and going, wow, that, that makes total sense. I never I never thought of that. I I don't know that I'll ever think of it any other way again. You know, those those moments that we can bring to people and and we all know because we speak. It, we all know the difference in working with an audience that is totally comfortable, totally into I'm not talking physically comfortable, I'm talking about mentally comfortable. Um, and, and they're into it. And, and so I, 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 I feel like that, that style of I don't know what I'm doing kind of makes me a little bit more relatable. So. I think that's, 
That's good, right? The, the unique approach. And I, and I personally went through, and Jimmy, you and I have talked a little bit about this, and it, I, you still struggle a little bit with that imposter syndrome. And I think what I worry about sometimes is that <clears throat> as a communicator that I'm going to come across like I have all the answers. But to Bob, your point is you have to help them self-discover those through the way that, you know, the, the, the spirit puts those words in your mouth. I think what I've l- learned over the years that's important is, Andy, you said it earlier, is I, I'm in a constant state of learning. Yeah. And so I, I'm learning from you guys right now. Today, I'm like, I'm soaking all this in going, man, this is so good. What, what, what can I do to be better because of what I just heard? But I don't think sometimes I, 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 I communicate that to others. So when I'm out on a stage, sometimes I have, hey, here's a bunch of information about how the brain works and how to make you a better communicator and a better connector and all that stuff. But I think the more you let people in to your vulnerabilities around what you don't know, back to your earlier point, Andy, uh, the more that authenticity comes across. And I think that's why your style works so well with people. Uh, I I often feel like, and maybe you guys have, have felt the same at times, where if someone feels like they enjoyed your talk, but they also feel like they could have gotten up and given it. It's probably good, right? It's probably where you didn't overwhelm them, right? With uh, I wasn't an intellectual entertainer for an hour. They actually felt like they got something from it. But they're like, oh, it's like the Geico commercial. I guess I knew that. I guess I didn't realize it. He framed it in a different way that I hadn't considered. You know, there before, there is so. a danger in, um, I, I think any speaker that is really worth anything knows a lot. I mean, they're just, they just know a lot. They have a lot to say. And yet the way the audience receives that is also up to the speaker because you, you know, I found myself years ago in doing these seven decision seminars based on the traveler's gift. Um, I, I found I started watching people look at me as an expert on these things. And and I found that one of the best things that I could do to calm people down and get them back in a thinking mode is after the second or third decision to say, hey, can I, I got to stop right here and just say uh, that just because I know these seven things doesn't mean I'm an expert on them. Um, I'm really learning these things. I, I'm kind of thinking through this with you. And so I, I more relate to you uh, as a mom or dad than I do to, to somebody who probably knows the, the, the psychological words and all about this because I've come upon this organically reading books and talking to people. And so just know that as we go through this, I, I'm, I'm thinking through it too. And so I, I kind of see people re- relax when I do that. And I also think, and this is just a speaking style, but I always think it's important not to sound like you you memorized everything, you know? I mean, we all know that we have bits that we do over and over and over, and we could say them in our sleep, but you got to make those, I feel like if you're going to be a, an effective communicator, you want to make those relatable. And when you're having a conversation with somebody, your words aren't perfect. Sometimes you, you sometimes you pause, sometimes you, you, you look away, sometimes you go, you know, it's, it's, uh, shoo, uh, what's that word? Um, or sometimes you just go, It's like this. And speakers are scared to have that silence. They're scared to have that pause. But that's what real conversations are like. Yes. Yeah, that's good. I'm, I'm afraid because I charge by the minute. So I want to make sure that they understand. No, I'm kidding. Uh, you when, I was, when, when I was 28, I met, uh, I was doing a, my dad was doing a search for Norman Vincent Peale, uh, who, of course, wrote The Power of Positive Thinking. And he was a pastor in New York. And I'm sitting there with them and we're doing the, the, we're doing the, the publisher for him for Guidepost magazine. And, and so it's, I'm 28. I'm sitting with him and he turns to me, he says, so you're a speaker, Bob. I had never spoken before at all. And I said, mm, I, I don't know. And he goes, no, I'm not just like talking to you. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you like you're a speaker. So do you want the, do you want to know the tip? And I said, yeah, well, yes, I'd like to know the tip. And he goes, no notes. 
Don't go out there with dang no notes. He says, otherwise God can't talk to you and give you a different story. I never know what stories I'm going to bring. I'm just kind of going with the crowd. They, they're they fun. I'm a little more fun. If they're, if they're boring, I'm going to try to hit over here. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing because I'm just trying to listen to something. I mean, I'm not, a, I'm an executive recruiter. I hadn't even ever thought I'd ever be a, a speaker. I mean, <laughs> I can't write a memo. How would I write a book? So on that note from Bob, we're going to pause because that was so much to take in that we're actually going to extend this onto another episode. And I can't tell you how excited I am. This first episode with three of the greatest minds of our time in their own right, Andy Andrews, Bob Bodine, and Jimmy Yeary, and how much wisdom that we've gleaned out of them. I hope you were taking notes because it was some incredibly powerful stuff. 